Thank you, Nico. That was really, really, really lovely talk. Um, very scholarly. I'm, I'm going to do something probably much more perma uh, personal, just because I'm, I'm part of the story, and it's, it's my story as well. I'm, I'm going to do maybe three things. I'm going to talk a little bit about the drawings and the reflect on maybe the importance of showing them right now. I'm going to um, talk about um, Alvin as a, as a Canadian emigre, which I think is interesting. I'm going to play a tape of about seven minutes long from 1972. Um, he felt he was born and brought up in Canada, but left it, and always felt deeply ambiguous about Canada, I think. So I think that's something I'd like to play. That's an undercurrent, which maybe we can refer to later. And the other thing is I want to bring the, the idea that for Alvin particularly, ambiance was really a critical tool for uh, radicalizing education, really. I think that's um, what, what you'll hear. And you'll hear him talking about the, the tyranny of the curriculum and how education really needed to be changed. And I, I, I wonder how much it has changed here and in North America, everywhere. So that's another thing perhaps we can talk about later. Um, the drawings, just, just to talk about the drawings, they were really um, kind of traded, a bit like postcards or, or baseball cards. There was a, something about exchange and discourse. So the drawings, as a collection, emerged probably over about 10, 15 years. And, and basically, friends of Alvin or students would, would give him a drawing, and that would be part of an exchange you know, as any student has with a teacher, or maybe it's to do with there was an exhibition or a publication. So Alvin amassed this collection of drawings, which he, he kept mostly in his uh, office at the AA, on the walls, um, just bouncing around. There were so many drawings that he had to stack them up against the walls. Um, after he died, they all came to his house, our house, and they were just, again, sort of plastered on walls, um, we didn't really look at them for many years. They, they just represented something. And at a certain point, we were approached by some friends of ours, Chris Bart in, in particular, who's, who's a professor at RISD, who I'd got to know there. And he said, why don't you show these drawings? There's probably some interest in it. Uh, this was probably six or seven years ago. And we just thought it was a really interesting idea. We hadn't thought of it. And I think that the context that, again, is interesting to talk about these drawings is they're all produced in a pre-digital world. There was not a single piece of software involved in, in their gestation or, or reproduction. So they, they represent a time when, when architects and students were all inventing their own drawing style appropriating other techniques, collage, um, you know, axonometric, isometric. And in the context of the AA, drawing was never taught. There were never really drawing classes. That, there wasn't the sense in North America that you, you get taught to draw. It was really more about learning how to draw and finding a way that was appropriate to your own idea or project. So that's the, that's the sort of context of, of the drawings. Um, it's interesting now, Now, I mean, you know, we all draw with computers, we use software, but it's like we all talk with Google and Facebook, you know, we don't seem to communicate much um, any other way. And I think the, the idea that um, you can make your own drawing technique to reflect what you want to is very empowering. I think it's something that people should reflect about uh, as students and really realize that we don't have to worry about AutoCAD or you know, all these different softwares, just as we can talk to each other without PowerPoint, with Google, etc. The drawings have show has really, uh, it's coincided with other interests in drawings. There's, there's a big symposium at the Bartlett this uh, November, which is talking about the hand drawing and also how the hand and the digital can sort of talk to each other. And everywhere this show has been, which has been in St. Louis, RISD, Cooper Union, and now here, there's been a real uh, sort of resurgence of interest in, in the drawing as a possibility. Uh, as, well, we can go back to ambiance. I know everybody will talk about it, but the way that the drawing can capture and describe and be the tool to develop an interest or an idea. 
And, and moving forward, the, the show is next, it's coming back to London, and then it's going on a trip through Europe. It's going to go to uh, Brussels, Maastricht, Ljubljana, Paris, and possibly Berlin. And, and here, uh, we've been approached by, by friends, teachers, who just really want to, to use the drawings as a sort of instrumental way for getting students to think about drawing. Um, so it's become quite a sort of pedagogical tool for, for a sort of, I guess, a critical view towards the production of architecture. Also, you know, the drawings were not produced in a corporate environment. They're not construction drawings. They, they stand on their own as a sort of expression of ideas. At, turning to education, and this is really the, 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 the thing I'd like to contribute uh, to the contribution to the conversation about ambiances is this uh, this critique of education that really personified Alvin all the way through his life. He was a, a kind of insurgent radical of education, and our childhood was really quite um, uh, well. We wandered a lot because he was always getting fired from jobs because he was um, crossing the the authorities. This happened at the Bartlett. This happened at the AA. I think, I'm not quite sure how the terms he left Chicago, but um, we, we crossed the Atlantic many times because of, 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 of his um, real dissatisfaction with what was going on in education and his kind of views about what he thought it should be. Um, so I think what, what I'll do now is play, play this tape. It's about nine, seven minutes long. We've excerpted it from a, a bigger audio. It, it's from 1972, and it's the final of the three summer sessions that he had. And some of the people are going to be in the room, definitely David, David Lieberman, whose voice I think we hear is, is here, and maybe others. And this was a participants forum where all the students could get together and talk about their views on architectural education. There were, this is coming in response to a group of students from Toronto, and also David, who was not from Toronto, had a, a sort of different, more position, probably more in line with Alvin. So Alvin is sort of talking about really his gripes with education, where he thinks it should go. And he's also taking a pot as an emigre, pot shot at Canada, which I think would be very interesting to hear your thoughts. So I'm just going to play it now. And I hope you can hear it. Like all, what the School of Architecture do uh, stopping an expressway? Maybe some students did something, maybe not. But that's not really where the problem lies. I mean, what you've been describing is probably typical of what a lot of people are experiencing. That is to say, there's a paternalistic curriculum. Uh, that is to say, uh, first of all, the word curriculum is paternalistic. If uh, several hundred people uh, are told that over a period of four or five years they are to go through these sorts of exercises because they are good for them. However, why is the, the initial prescription is three years later instead of day, six years later, you might want to do just the opposite. But so that the beginning with the curriculum for, for a lot of people is very difficult to think, you know, because of this uh, rapid change. Secondly, um, if you could have a school with seven, several hundred people coming into it who come with different backgrounds and with different interests. I mean, I, I was in Chicago, and Chicago is a city where, uh, you know, a half a million people came to settle there every 10 years between about 1880 and World War I. You know, for, for those 50 years, uh, two to three million people immigrated, you know. And so you have a city which is full of Italians or Greeks or Japanese or Turks or, you know, people come from everywhere. And if you have a school of architecture and you say to all these people, this is what you should learn because it's good for you, uh, then you're, you're excluding the life enhancing possibilities which three or four hundred students can bring into the school based on their own experience. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I just have to finish that. Because 
we are talking about not Toronto, we're talking about say the curriculum and Ljubljana. I haven't heard about it. Maybe we're talking about that, or maybe we're talking about the curriculum in Perth, Australia, where there is a curriculum. And the curriculum is, is aimed in various ways. It's aimed to be good for the students, it's aimed to satisfy the Institute of Architects, it's aimed to satisfy the architectural profession itself. And it has a very interesting problem that you might have, um, the other issue is that society at large faces problems. And if the curriculum is aimed tactically at really hitting at the problems of society so that the school becomes a workshop which is really tinkering with issues which are expected to break the background to them and taking some kind of role you know, or some kind of stand of them, well in advance, informed and a theoretical way, using all the, all the energy students and the staff, then you will have something quite on the line. But if you were, from the point of view of prescribe, this is your first program in the first year because this is good for you to teach you how to see, and this is your second one, it's good for you because you teach you how to write, and this is good for you because you learn how to join brick and glass. You, you've already got somebody who suggested uh, that this is what architecture, architects, uh, social problems, etc., etc., are all about ways to be solved. Now, within this kind of situation, there's, of course, dialectic because the students and staff can fight against it. And the noise in the system is all about the fight against the, I'm going to call it the tyrannical uh, curriculum, the tyranny of the curriculum, and the people in the school fighting it. And that's where all the energy and noise is, and the victories are always minor victories about one change in the original that was declaration of curriculum or something you were reading, the, the handed down or received statement. So that you will spend a lot of time amending that received statement. And that's where a lot of student energy will go, a lot of discussion about freedom, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And it may be, and it's just my feeling, that it may be that the major issue of a growing country, which has an opportunity, which a lot of European countries have now no longer have. The, the more affluent European countries, like the Scandinavian countries, or the Swiss, and the Dutch, or the Belgium, and so on, they have an opportunity to actually try to figure out what the middle class is, you know, the, uh, what the people who have sufficient uh, money and uh, you know, economic power and something to do with the one. Oh, we haven't really heard great you know, we're not getting any signals, nor from Switzerland, nor from Poland, nor from Belgium, and so on. But it seems to me that Canada um, can almost point towards middle class utopia. And it'd be very interesting to see uh, what this would be. Not any of us want to participate in it particularly, but it would be fabulous to know that in Toronto, forget the middle class bit, they're defining the issues of how a continent can be colonized, how vast new populations can be in some way accommodated, how the standard of life and all that can be, uh, can be raised, how useful research to help other less fortunate parts of the world is undertaken, uh, how the problem of cities which are growing much faster than many other places in the world, except where the other one is, can anticipate this growth and operate. We'd like to hear different tactics and strategies which are emerging from all of these problems. And that's the definition of a good school. If the people in the school are actually conversant with these problems and working at them, and that the so-called curriculum is, is conditioned daily, weekly, and annually by the whole gamut of these kinds of problems. And as you've been listening to Peter Cook and others, but there's never a straightforward scene. It's always overlapping, and you have to solve many problems at once. Now, I'd be a little hard because I just thought it would be interesting. I'd say it's a square Okay, thank you.